Hi everyone, we're going to be looking at the Kite Runner because this is what we are going to be reading in class soon. So it's important to look at the historical, political, and cultural context when we're looking at the Kite Runner. Um, this is the author, his name is Khaled Hosseini, and he's actually one of the first Afghan authors to come to America and have a book translated. So it's significant. He was actually at Purdue probably about two or three years ago doing a presentation. But even though this is a book of fiction, meaning that it's not 100% real, it is actually based off of his experiences while he was in Afghanistan. So looking at Afghanistan, we have the world map. Afghanistan is located right here. And this is where the book is primarily going to be taking place. Um, you'll see that in the beginning, the author is going to be over here, and he's going to be talking from California and basically having flashbacks to when he was over in Afghanistan. And just looking at this, if I were to zoom in, Afghanistan is going to be significant because not only have we had multiple wars there, but geographically, this is going to be significant because Afghanistan is over here in Asia, we have Europe over here, and we have Africa. So essentially what's going to happen is that people from Africa are going to be going through the Middle East. People from Europe are going to be going through the Middle East via the Mediterranean Sea. And then people are going to be coming from Asia to go to Europe and Africa. Afghanistan is going to be that kind of place where people can go ahead and meet. And there's going to be a lot of different conflicts regarding this area throughout history. If we were to zoom in in Afghanistan, so here we have Afghanistan and is right next to Iran, which is always in the news. Afghanistan is always in the news as well. We have Pakistan right here. We also have India right here. So Afghanistan, also part of it touches China. So we're really not that far away from China or Mongolia, which is just to the north of that. Remember this because this is going to be crucial when it comes to our characters later in the book. Kabul right here is the capital of Afghanistan and this is where the author is going to be living and this is where most of the story is going to be taking place. This is probably one of those good things to know. So why are we looking at this? We have to better understand and appreciate, should be and appreciate, the context of the kite runner a basic understanding of Afghan history, politics, and culture, which is going to be necessary. And for looking at the majority of this, Afghanistan is going to be that crossroads of all these civilizations and empires that are going to just kind of meet and converge in one specific place, which is going to be a broader place, more like the Middle East. So what's going to happen is that Afghanistan is going to emerge as a nation around 1747. So about a hop, skip, and a jump before the United States is going to have their independence. And it's going to take a while for Afghanistan to finally be formed because we're going to have centuries of fragmentation. We're going to have centuries of rules by other invaders. and. This guy right here, his name is Ahmed Khan. He's going to be crowned king. And people have seen him, Ahmed Khan, people know him as, or I guess Afghanis refer to him as Ahmed Sahababa. They're going to know him as the founder of this Afghan nation. Saha literally means king. Baba means father of the nation. So he's going to be the father of the nation or he's going to be king. And what's going to happen is that he is going to be part of this Sadozai clan, which is going to be a Pashtun, a Pashtun ethnic group. When I talk about ethnic groups, it's kind of like talking about how we have Chinese or Italian or German. We have different ethnic groups from around the world. Well, this is going to be another ethnic group. And this clan is going to be ruling from about 1747 until 1826. And then this clan, 
the Hamadzai clan is going to be taking over after, and they are going to take over from 1826 until 1978. The very last president that we have is going to be Muhammad Daud, and he's going to be essentially a prime minister, prime minister and president can kind of go hand in hand. Prime minister is a person who's going to be in charge of the country, kind of like Great Britain has a prime minister. And what he's going to do is that he's going to be prime minister from 1953 to 1963. So he's going to be in charge for about 10 years. And while this is going to be happening, we're going to have a lot of issues where power from the last Afghan king in 1973 um, is going to kind of play a role in this Afghan history. We're going to be talking about communism a lot, and I'm going to get to communism in a second. But what's significant is that in 1973, so 10 years after Dowd was prime minister, we are going to be having a republic. So that republic meaning that we're not going to have a monarchy in charge. Instead, it's going to be a person who is technically elected. So here's a couple things that you need to know. The Afghan rulers, so people like Dowd, they wanted to have this really strong state. They wanted to have a very strong central government. They needed to have a government that would have good economic development. They wanted to modernize Afghanistan. They didn't want to be behind everybody else. However, there's a lot of things that really made this difficult, and two things that are going to make this difficult are going to be different countries. We're going to have issues with the British. and issues with Russia. Sorry, I can't really write on here with a mouse. This is sort of difficult. And this is going to be a huge issue with both of these. For the good part of the 19th and 20th century, so when I say 19th century, I mean the 1800s. When I say the 20th century, I mean the 1900s. So these two are going to contribute to Afghan history a lot more than you would really think. And so this begins what we call the Great Game. And this Great Game is going to be where... I'm going to go back to the world map. This great game is going to be between Great Britain up here, Russia over here, and also India. And the British at this point are going to have a really strong influence in India. And the reason for that is because the British are going to be kind of taking over everything that they possibly can have. So India at this point in time was very vulnerable. The British went ahead, jumped into this country, and now they're taking fully over um, all of India. Why did they want this? Well, because they wanted these warm water ports around India. So they wanted control of this around about the Philippines and then the coast of Africa. And what happened is that the British basically said that whoever has control over Afghanistan let me get the right pen color so you can see it. They said whoever has control over Afghanistan will basically determine who has control over India, which is why Afghanistan is going to be thrown into the mix here. So they feel like they need to take over Afghanistan, they need to take over Pakistan, which is the neighbor right next door, and then that's kind of like their gateway over to India. However, we have the Russians, and the Russians are going to have convoys over in Afghanistan. And what the British thought was that the Afghans were more, I guess, sympathetic towards the Russians, and they thought that maybe the king at the time thought that maybe Russia would be the better ally. So in 1839,
we have the British. They're going to invade Afghanistan because they are threatened by the fact that Russia has a presence over here. After all this is said and done, so here we have Afghanistan again. Oops. Afghanistan is going to become, there's going to be conflicts between Russia and, the, and Great Britain. Afghanistan is going to become kind of like a buffer zone, meaning that there isn't really going to be fighting in Afghanistan. The Russians and the British basically decided that we're going to agree to disagree. So they decide that it's going to be a buffer state and that both Great Britain <clears throat> and Russia are going to essentially make this country an area where they're going to transform it and do magical things and make sure that there's going to be really great power put in place and a nice government, all of that. However, there really is probably underlining meaning behind it, meaning that Great Britain or Russia is still kind of wanting to take over Afghanistan. So here's this idea of the Cold War, and this is something that we'll be looking at in greater depth, but essentially the 30-second version of the Cold War is that um, a hot war means that there's going to be constant fighting. A Cold War means that there's going to be conflict. However, there's never really going to be any gunfire. So we're going to have these areas where there's going to be communism. Communism is going to be marked by the red. Communism meaning that the government has complete control over everything, including private property and industry, versus places like the United States. And what the competition is going to be here is basically over nuclear arms. So we're going to have a competition between, it's called the arms race, who can get the bigger and best nuclear weapons. Some of you might have heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Here's Cuba right here, 90 miles away from Florida. At one point, the Soviet Union actually had missiles pointing directly at us. And this is going to be a huge thing that um, really frightened a lot of people in the United States. For um, that this conflict is going on, Afghanistan is going to want to maintain their customs and their culture that they have. However, they're not going to like the fact that they're going to be taken over all the time. So, I just kind of talked about the Cold War a little bit, but now we're going to go a little bit more in depth. So at this point in time, the U.S. government is going to be kind of like the supplier for a lot of different countries for mass production of weapons. And Afghanistan had requested arms. Why? Well, because Afghanistan is going to feel threatened by all this going on. There's going to be nuclear weapons, obviously, as a country you want to protect yourself. So the Afghans are going to turn to the United States. They say, listen, do you have weapons that you can help us with? Of course, the United States say, absolutely not. So remember that they had an ally before, so they're going to go to the Soviet Union. And the Afghans are going to say, listen, Soviet Union, I need your help. And um, the Soviet Union not only provided for the Afghanistan military, but they also built airports. They had thousands of Afghans who went to the Soviet Union for military training. And this was also the Soviets' opportunity to form a communist government within Afghanistan. So they saw it as not only a I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine sort of situation, where I'll give you weapons as long as you help our cause, but the Soviet Union also saw them as being vulnerable so that they could take advantage of them and also step in and create this communist government. Next we have the Taliban. So the Taliban is something that we always see in the news. We're always hearing about the Taliban. It's important to note that the Taliban, even though these are Muslim people, they only make up a small percent of the population. We've talked about this before, stereotyping and how a small percentage of a group can make the larger group look bad. That's the same thing with the Taliban. The Taliban comes from the Arabic word Talib, which um, is someone who seeks religious knowledge before he becomes a preacher in a mosque. So there are going to be religious roots here. They were the sons of Afghan refugees in Pakistan, and they attended Pakistani schools of theology. So these are people who were studying the Islamic religion. They became active 
1944, Here's Pakistan. Here's the capital, Islamabad. I wish I could talk. And this area right here is Kandahar. And this is where the Taliban is going to be taking over in terms of being in Afghanistan. So here's Pakistan right here, Kandahar right next door. And by 1997, the Taliban held about 90% of Afghan territory, including the capital of Kabul. So not only are they going to be taking over slowly by coming over to Kandahar, but they're going to be taking over about 90% of Afghanistan. Slowly, of course, just not right away. So at this point in time, when the Taliban was forming and then they're growing exponentially, only three countries are going to actually recognize the Taliban government. That's going to be Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Pakistan. So what can we conclude from this? Well, the Cold War was between the United States and the former Soviet Union, and this brought death and utter destruction to Afghanistan as a country. Remember that Afghanistan is going to be kind of in the middle of, of this kind of tug of war between communism and democracy. Over 5 million Afghans are going to end up abandoning their homes. They're going to be exiled to other countries. This means that a high population of Afghans are going to be leaving somewhere else. And with that, we've kind of talked about this before when people move from place to place, it's sort of like they're nomadic. They also bring with them their ideas, their cultures, their values. 1.5 million people are going to lose their lives. So a lot of death and destruction. But mainly what happened is that a lot of people just wanted to leave their homes because they just wanted a safe place to live. Here's looking at what the Taliban has done recently. So in 96, the Taliban has seized control of Kabul, which again is the capital of Afghanistan. Women can't work. They introduced Islamic punishment, which is, compared to our standards, a very archaic way of thinking. Um, this includes stoning people to death and also amputating. I watched a documentary one time where they said that they would, if somebody were to lie, they would take this hot rod and put it into a fire and then place it on the person's tongue. Well, if the person's tongue were to blister, that meant that they were lying. Well, obviously, everybody's tongue is going to blister. So just different ways of doing punishments that we would not necessarily recognize within the United States. This idea of stoning people to death sorry, I want to get a pen color that I can actually see, is going to come up within the Kite Runner. And this is something that is still practiced today. It's important to note that the Kite Runner, although it is a work of fiction, it is based off of true events, and that stoning people to death, literally by throwing rocks at them, is something that still goes on. And we need to recognize that in terms of how things work within the Middle East. 1997, the Taliban recognized is recognized as legitimate rulers by Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. And now they control about two-thirds of the country, meaning of Afghanistan. In 98, the U.S. is going to launch missiles as suspected bases of militant Osama bin Laden is accused of bombing U.S. embassies in Africa. We have Osama bin Laden. We obviously know what happens to his fate. That's when Navy SEAL Team 6 is going to go in and assassinate him. In 99, the U.S. financial sanctions are going to force Afghanistan to hand over Osama bin Laden for trial. In 2001, the Taliban is going to order religious minorities, so people who are not going to be their, necessarial, their necessary sect of um, Islam, meaning that if you are not Muslim or if you are Hindu, they need to have women veil themselves, so they have these burqas. The burqa is where you can barely see anything, maybe just like a mesh screen around their eyes or maybe just their eyes, um, just like other Afghan women. Also, U.S. Britain, they're going to launch airstrikes against Afghanistan over the Taliban, uh, after the Taliban, and they're going to refuse to hand over Osama bin Laden. Um, Osama bin Laden, of course, is responsible for the September 11th terrorist attacks on the Trade Center of this country. So when we're looking at 
these populations. It's important to know that the Pashtun people are going to be the primary ethnic group and the primary languages are going to be Pashtun and Dari and they're going to Afghanistan as a whole is 99 percent Muslim. 84 percent of them are going to be Sunni Muslims. So there's a difference between Sunnis and Shiites and we talked about that last semester. But it is important to know that Islam is the majority of what people believe over in Afghanistan. So the Pashtuns are the majority. They're going to have a strong voice in the government. These are some Pashtun people. The Tajiks, they're going to be the second largest. They're going to be kind of like the people who live in like the country. So um, they're going to be really into agriculture. They're going to be living small town life. And then we're going to have the so there you have it. That is a very brief introduction to Afghan history, politics, and also culture. But hopefully that gives you a good background so that you at least have a basic understanding of what Afghanistan was like historically.